Okay, welcome to Plants, Pests, and, and, and Pathogens. We have some announcements to take place before we start the actual meeting, um, which will be in about nine minutes. Okay, bright good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us 
for the, this presentation of Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. I'm Lucy Bradley. I'm the Extension Specialist at NC State for Urban Horticulture and also the State Coordinator for the Master Gardener Program and your MC this morning. Um, delighted to be here with you. I want to introduce Lee J. Temple, our amazing instructional technologist. Um, Lee J., welcome. Good morning, everyone. Wanted to give you a little uh, overview of Collaborate if you are just uh, joining us for the first time. Um, to the left, you have your participant window. Under your name, you should see four buttons. One's a smiley face. To, you can use emoticons to let us know how we're doing. Um, the next is if you need to step away, that'll let us know that you're away from your computer. If you have a question, you can click on the hand icon to raise your hand. And um, we will call on you, and you can ask your question either in the chat or uh, vocally. Um, the last is a checkbox, and depending on um, what's being asked, it might be a checkbox or a letter. So if you see that check, go ahead and click on the green check, yes. Okay. And our presenters uh, occasionally ask um, for your interaction in that way. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and ask them, or you can type them in the chat window. The chat is right below the participant window. So if you type um, into the chat room, everyone um, in this presentation, including the moderators, can see um, what your question is, and we can get to you. Um, one thing I'd like for you to do is to let us know where you're coming from today. So if you'll click on the tool that looks like a sunburst, and then click on your county, that'll let us know what part of the state you're in. That's when you want to talk, I think. And we ask that you keep your microphone off unless you are talking, and that helps cut down on feedback. Um, you can press the talk button um, one more time, and that will turn the talk off. If you have any questions, just let me know. Back to you. I know so much about computers. I said, no, I don't. You know, she gets but I don't. I mean, I'm just a couple of people really have their mic on, and we're figuring you. If you would turn your so microphone off, we'll be able to and, and um, hear the speaker. And do it properly. Oh. Uh, okay. How do we make that And they change oh, that. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe Lita can help us just mute everybody. We got that. Okay. Great. Um, So thank you, Lee J. We've got a great program lined up for everyone this morning. Um, our featured speaker is Mark Webbington from the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Um, Mark is the assistant director, uh, curator of, of plants at, at the Arboretum, world tra traveler and, and collector of, of plants. And I'm very excited that he's agreed to, to join us. Um, we have Showstoppers with Mark Blevins, and current issues in, in, in insects with Matt Bertone from the entomology department, and Mike Munster is here with us with current issues and diseases. So Mark, you're up. Welcome. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? I guess I can't answer that if you've got everybody muted. So <laughs> I will assume everybody can hear me. This is Wait. this is my first uh, uh, webinar, so bear with me. All good. Somebody put they can hear me in the, the chat box, so I think I can figure can this out here. Yeah. Um, uh, I hope most of you have been to the uh, the J. C. Ralston Arboretum. If if you haven't, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. Talk a little bit about what we do. Um, some resources we have for uh, master gardeners and extension agents and, and the general public, uh, both on site and online, and then talk a little bit about uh, how we go about doing what we um, what we do. Uh, whoop, that's not it. Um, let, 
let me know when my when my talk is loaded up. I know we've uh, I tend to do a lot of images, um, so uh, I think I, I may have overloaded the system um, with uh, with my images. But the the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, we're the the uh, research and display garden for NC State uh, here at campus. We're, we're kind of across the railroad tracks from the state fairgrounds. Seems like most folks know where the fairgrounds are, so um, that gives them a good sense of, of our location. Uh, we're pretty small. We're only um, only about uh, ten and a half acres. Uh, but in that ten and a half acres, we grow many thousands of uh, of plants. Um, we're kind of our our mission uh, is to uh, collect, evaluate um, plants, distribute both plants and information about those plants uh, to the public, in order to diversify the uh, the American landscape and to um, to support the green industry, that's that's a big part of, of what we do. So uh, JC uh, used to sign his letters uh, with "Plan and Plant for a Better World," and we've kind of taken that that on as a uh, our our philosophy. Um, for those who don't know JC Ralston, uh, he he started at at the Arboretum, and, well started at NC State in. Uh, 1975. The latter half of 1975, and we uh, we consider he started planting almost immediately. Uh, he was very much a um, you know ask forgiveness, not permission kind of person. And uh, a few years ago, uh, Horticulture Magazine did a uh, a spread of um, some of the the most influential. Uh, uh, Gardeners. We can't hear. In, in the, we can't um, hear. I can't remember the last Joe hundred years, there. maybe. And uh, JC says, is hear. in there. You see, uh, right there. Mark, if you can um, wait just a second until we get he, the. He's pictured. Uh, he's pictured. Uh, I think I may have covered it. He's actually pictured with a pair of pruners. He kind of had a reputation for um, acquiring propagules everywhere he went. But you can see there's some. Some other folks, Thomas Jefferson, and um, uh, let's see, Ernest Wilson, and and you know a whole slew of, of great um, gardeners there. So he's extremely well respected uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, if you really want some more information for, about him, there's a great book by Bobby Ward called Chlorophyll in His Veins. It tells you a whole lot about him. Uh, a lot of people. Who who knew him very well found that that book uh, pretty interesting. There was a lot um, about him that they they didn't know. So the arboretum, you know, I said JC started uh, the arboretum uh, in 1976, and you can see uh, right here that was the first plant that was planted as uh, the arboretum. That's a fastigiate English oak that was uh, given to him by his colleagues at Texas A&M when he came to Raleigh. Now there had been some plants there that predated the arboretum, but that was the first plant, and it's still growing strong. Um, it's not the best plant for the, the region, but it is still still there. Uh, now, for those of you who haven't been there, been here, uh, you know, just show some some uh, beauty pics. Uh, JC was one of the first people to really advocate for uh, conifers in the southeast. Uh, the conventional wisdom had been the conifers don't grow well here, and you know the dwarf conifers are now uh, 20, 30 feet tall. So that that kind of uh, disproved that theory, I think, and helped kickstart the, especially the cryptomeria, um, the Japanese cedar craze in the southeast. But we we do a lot of trials. We do them in in um, landscape settings in most cases. You see rose gardens, and we've actually just received some money to install. Uh, to move and, and, and install a new, larger, um, better rose garden. So very excited about that. Uh, Laugh House, one of the our signature um, garden areas where a lot of the very, very new uh, things are planted out um, in a little bit of a protected spot so that we can um, we can kind of baby them for the first year or two of, of their life and then move them out to other areas of the garden. 
And we're known for our woody plants, but we do have some, some fantastic uh, herbaceous collections like our perennial borders and, and some of our mixed borders. And Japanese gardens, um, you know, kind of a lot of the traditional um, landscape situations. We've really gotten big into some of, into some of our xeriscape gardens, a rooftop, um, a, a xeric garden, a scree garden where we're, we're growing plants uh, really from all over the world, from uh, the desert southwest, from our own North Carolina sand hills, from the um, Mediterranean climates of the west coast, and uh, the true Mediterranean region, and South African plants, and dry Asian plants, and um, really South American, uh, kind of all over the world, um, seeing what grows, what doesn't grow, and uh, how much we can abuse it um, out in our high heat and humidity. And a lot of lovely spots. Uh, we are almost entirely um, self-funded. The, the university pays for a few of our salaries, basically three salaries out of our 13-person um, staff. Everything else is generated through memberships, gifts, and grants, rentals like weddings here in the White Garden um, and, so, and we have some endowments but, but not nearly enough to really cover our expenditures. So we, we have to earn most of our keep. Um, we, we, in 2007 we developed a master plan which we just updated last year. This really guided our development. Some of those photos I showed you, we renovated the Southwest Garden, we put in a new Asian Valley, we, renovated our rooftop, our um, Japanese garden, our lath house, uh, expanded into this area. This was an extra two acres where we moved our annual trials um, and have started planting this area. And we're going to be putting in the new rose garden right in here. Very excited. So if you can't get here, and we hope most of you can visit us at some time or another, um, but if you can't make it to us, we do have a lot online uh, that, that you can see. Our, our website is, is just jcra at ncsu.edu. Very easy to remember. And online, um, you can search search our collections. Um, just go to our, uh, the horticulture tab and click on our plants. You can search the collections that way. Type in anything and, and it will show if we have it planted out. Um, you can also from there or from our uh, resources page with our photos, you can see, you can click on the photos. So if you searched for, say, uh, Calicanthus Hartledge wine, you would get uh, a notation of where it is in the arboretum, um, how we received it, so last size that we measured it, uh, and some, some information on it. We don't have that information for every plant, but uh, we're trying to. You can also, from there, get a map of the Arboretum with where those plants are. There were two of them on our list, the Hartlidge wine, so you can find that area. So if you want to come here and see a specific plant, you can, um, you can find it easily by going online. You can also see photos of it. You can see, this just shows a, a few of them, but you can see there are 76 photos of, of Hartlidge wine. We also online have a, uh, a bloom calendar. Uh, this is showing you kind of part of the seas, but you can see this is for when it flowers here at the Arboretum, not anywhere else, but just here at the Arboretum when we have um, photographed it in flower. As I find that very helpful if I'm writing articles, if you're a master gardener or agent writing articles. Um, it's a good one, you know, sometimes uh, you get stumped and oh, i got to write about something that's inquiring in August, uh, what can I write about? Um, this is a way you can just, I go on here all the time and kind of scroll down and I'll look at everything that's flowering in August and, oh yeah, that's what I want to write about. If you're writing for a, um, an education um, publication or doing an educational talk, 
for NC State as a master gardener or an agent, um, you are welcome to to uh, use our images, um, whether it's a print publication or a, or a like a slide presentation, a PowerPoint. You're welcome to use our images. Um, we can help you get those. Uh, if you tell us exactly what image you want, don't ask us to search through our um, 200,000 images for you. Um, you search them online, let them know what, uh, us know which one it is, and you are more than happy to use them. Just please credit the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. So how do we maintain all that we do, all those gardens? Um, we uh, search for uh, students. We have some full-time gardeners, but we also get some uh, summer interns, and you know we we uh, really uh, uh, sweet talk them into coming. You can see uh, that's that's about the, the truth of it. We don't put for almost no money, uh, but we do get some great uh, some great interns. Um, this is a uh, interns from a few year back, years back. If you know the Hoffman Nursery, uh, the grass nursery, that's David Hoffman. If you have Casey Nursery down in Goldsboro, that's Hunter Casey. A couple of the um, scions of our great um, North Carolina uh, uh, nurserymen. Um, here in the background is our uh, our director, uh, Ted Bilderback, and he's always there in, in the background, uh, getting those pictures. He likes to, to stay behind the scenes a little bit. So we also bring students out uh, for student projects. Uh, this is a group that's doing a fertilizing project, figuring out space, figuring out um, fertilizer rates. We have Plan ID classes, of course, out there, landscape construction, landscape maintenance. We have entomology. We have design students. We have forestry folks. We have uh, plant pathology, plant biology, kind of a whole slew of, of students doing work out at the Arboretum. We are a living laboratory. Um, and we often get those groups like the landscape construction uh, classes and landscape maintenance to do work and they're fantastic as long as you give them some pretty clear direction. Um, they, can, they can get the work done. So uh, people always ask how we get plants. Um, we, we get them from all over. Uh, Part of what we do is uh, we give plants out to everybody, and I'll talk about our distributions. And, and that, in turn, you know, the more you share, the more you get back. But here you can see, um, as of uh, last week, I guess, well, actually this week, planted out, we have about almost 10,000 plants or groups of plants, and that that's over 6,000 different types of plants. Um, just last year in, in 2013, we planted over a thousand different plants uh, representing um, 875 taxa. Uh, you can see some of the numbers. I, I used 8-1-2007 um, because that's when I started. So uh, that, that's what interests me, those, those numbers. I like to see what those are. I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. I, I really like that. Um, but you can see uh, we bring in a lot of plants and we plant a lot of plants. Uh, part of the reason we're not, you know, completely overwhelmed, you can see just since uh, uh, August 1st, we've, we've accessioned over 10,000 plants. Um, that's, uh, some of those are plants we bring in as cuttings, which may never root. Some of those are seed, which may never germinate. A lot of those things are things that we're just trialing, and we plant them out and they die. We kill a tremendous number of plants. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing because it, it lets us know a little bit more about those plants. So um, how do we get the plant? How do we acquire all those things? We have a long history of going out and collecting. Um, back in JC's time, he was in, collected in Mexico. He's fascinated with the, the Mexican flora. He also went to, um, to uh, Korea collected in Korea. Um, and some of his, some of the plants that he's best, kn best known for and the Arboretum is best known for came from those early introductions. Uh, Viburnum alabuki chindo uh, is one of the more popular plants in the, um, that, that has been introduced. That was from Korea trip. And his uh, Styrax emerald pagoda is, is perhaps his best known plant, which is a really nice 
upright oval headed plant with large flowers, larger leaves than the typical Styrax japonicus. For years we thought it was a, a tetraploid, um, but uh, we did some uh, work on that and found out that it's not. It's just a very large, very vigorous uh, form of, of a Japanese um, snowbell. Um, we've continued to go collecting. Uh, since I've been at the Arboretum, I've been collecting in Mexico, much to the U.S., uh, China several times, Taiwan several times, Japan um, a couple of times, uh, New Zealand, kind of all over the place. So we've continued that tradition um, going places. That's Japan during uh, Momiji Gari season or maple hunting season when people go leave the cities and go out and photograph and, and admire the, the maples in the wild. And you know, this is this is what, what uh, everybody thinks I'm doing is going out and enjoying the wilderness. This is the reality is um, I'm cleaning seeds for most of the night and getting about three or four hours of sleep at night before getting out and starting it again. And, and this is the other reality is um, can sometimes be a little difficult uh, collecting. This was after a typhoon that hit while we were in Taiwan, um, and uh, we, we got to sleep in our car that night during a typhoon. So, the glamour of plant hunting. And uh, even when you don't have uh, weather problems, it can be a little interesting getting around. And that that was that was a very accurate sign. And uh, you'd see signs like this, not in one spot, but in lots of different spots, and, and you never knew what you were going to come across. Interestingly, we could continue going here. We could follow a, a road that went down here and forded the, the stream and drove back around. You know, it was kind of interesting doing that in a, a minivan. And the food, you know, when you go collecting is always uh, interesting. Um, iguana does not tastes like chicken, I can tell you that for sure. Uh, but even when you stay in the U.S., uh, sometimes uh, the food's a little iffy. You get out in the country and uh, uh, I don't know about eating sushi at Mac's uh, uh, food store. I'll take the iguana. But you do it all so you can get these uh, fantastic plants um, and, and uh, hopefully you get good germination. Um, you get plants growing on. Sometimes you get really interesting things like uh, variegated um, uh, uh, persimmons. But we don't just go collecting in the wild. We um, we visit nurseries all the time. Uh, North Carolina has some of the best nurseries in the country, in the world. Um, but we, we visit them. We go other places. Uh, this is in the, the West Coast at Sistus Design Nursery. We go to nurseries in Japan and New Zealand and, and uh, China to, to find plants. And you know the, the little dirty crowded ones, those are the ones where you find the really good stuff. Um, makes the good nurserymen uh, really cringe because uh, the plants are root bound and not staked nicely, but uh, sometimes you can find some real treasures there. Problem is keeping those things alive. But um, botanic gardens are part of a whole network. Um, we, we exchange seeds with each other so through a program called the Index Semina or Seed Lists. Uh, so these are just some of the seeds that we've gotten in from various uh, uh, gardens one year. Um, and, and we do that every year we get, these, we get seeds like this. And we're lucky here at NC State to have some some fantastic breeders. Our, our former director, Denny Werner, has been breeding Budlias, the, the blue chip, Miss Ruby, Miss Molly, some of those um, um, butterfly bush, and then also red buds like uh, the Merlot and Ruby Falls, and the new one this year, pink pom poms, which is this Texensis type with the thick glossy leaf and double flowers like uh, flame red bud, if you're familiar with that. Really fantastic plant. Uh, and then Tom Ranney up in the mountains and Fletcher, he gets twice as much done as anybody else. Uh, we're convinced it's because he's far away from campus and doesn't have to deal with some of the um, university politics. Uh, but he's been breeding stuff uh, like sweet tea, the, the Gordonia-Franklinia hybrid, um, 
He's also just released this year in conjunction with the North, uh, North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association, uh, Little Ruby Dogwood, which is a hybrid between a very, very hardy uh, evergreen dogwood and a pink Kusa dogwood. So it gets, it has, it's ev semi-evergreen, pink flowers, and gets a uh, winter color like a burning bush. Phenomenal. That's, that's new on the market this year, so look for that. Little Ruby Dogwood. And sometimes we get plants from weird places. I got a call from somebody uh, who had something interesting. I drive out there, find out I'm on an alpaca farm. Um, but we go out in the woods and find this plant. Uh, that's a weeping uh, form of our native um, uh, Vegas, our native uh, 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 beach, which there are virtually no uh, selections of our native beach. Um, lots of selections of the European Vegas uh, Vegas sylvatica, but hardly any of our own native one. So this is a little dwarf weeper we're calling white lightning. Uh, you can see that branch pattern on there. You can see why we call it white lightning. And um, it's slow growing and it's hard to graft, so we'll see what kind of commercial potential it has. But if we can get it working out in production, um, you know, it's a native. It, it would take the, the spot of, say, a Japanese maple, a, a weeping Japanese maple could be really, really interesting. Um, so we get all these plants in, and what do we do with them? Um, well, part of what we do is we evaluate them. Uh, we have formal evaluations like our, our annual color trials uh, that we evaluate. Um, you can come out and see them and see what's, uh, what's really performing the best in terms of, of uh, the annuals and, and the tender um, perennials that we have out there. We're also doing some more perennial trials as, as part of this as well. Um, we're part of a lot of evaluation programs. We're part of the National Boxwood Trial. So we um, go out and do evaluations of, of boxwoods, how they're resistant to uh, diseases and insects, uh, how well they grow, um, what kind of uh, visual impact they have. Um, we do evaluations for a lot of nurseries. J. Frank Schmidt on the West Coast sends us lots of trees. Uh, we do trials for Terra Nova and for Proven Winners and all kinds of groups like that. Um, we're also part of, uh, we're, we're active members in the American Public Gardens Association, the umbrella organization for, for public gardens, and very active in the North American Plant Collections Consortium. Uh, NAPCC, perhaps the, the worst acronym around. It's, it's kind of a mouthful. We hold national uh, NAPCC collections of, of red buds, uh, sources. We have the national collection. And we're part of a multi-institution collection for magnolias. So those are two of our significant collections. Um, and uh, we've received money uh, to go wild collect two endemic magnolias from Taiwan, one of which is, is pretty endangered, uh, so we'll be doing that this, this fall as part of our, our um, work with the NAPCC. You see the, the red buds. Um, we've got a, a very significant collection of, of red buds, and then magnolias. You can see the other institutions that are part of that magnolia group. But we also just evaluate the plants that are out in the landscape. Uh, this is, well, after the 2007 drought, that 100-year drought where we had so much damage, one of the, the plants, that were, one of the groups that got really devastated for us were our viburnums. Uh, but we noticed viburnum ovovatum, the southeastern uh, native viburnum, uh, called Walter's viburnum, uh, was virtually untouched by, by the um, by the drought. So we really started looking at that and assembling a larger collection of viburnum ovovatum. We just named one um, uh, Ralston Hardy, which is a Ms. Schiller's type viburnum ovovatum, but a little bit different growth habit, and uh, we found it to be hardier after this winter, especially in nurseries. Another one that came through in 2007 were the podocarps. So we have been collecting and collecting and collecting as many different forms of uh, Podocarpus uh, that we can, especially Necropolis because that's the hardiest uh, form. But, but we've been looking at other ones as well, both Asian and um, 
uh, southern hemispheres, hemisphere forms like from Australia and New Zealand and, and South America. You can see a lot of great forms out there like royal flush and golden crown um, that have new color flush on the, the new color on the flushes that come out and variegated forms um, and different uh, we just with University of Florida named and released one called Sunshine Spire that's a very narrow upright one. We also released plants through our, our plant collections. This was a, a sedum we collected uh, in Taiwan that uh, has already been in some plant introduction programs in Virginia. They, they released that through their beautiful gardens program. Uh, a lot of nurserymen are really uh, in liking this plant. And a Dianella uh, Yushan, which we collected in, in Taiwan as well. New fascias. Fascias, the, the Taiwan fascia, polycarpa, we were really excited about because look at that texture and those leaves, phenomenal. Um, it also grows much quicker than fascia japonica, which is such a tough plant, but it grows so slow that it's, it's tough in nurseries uh, to make money on it. So we're very excited about that, but man, most of our forms got hit really hard this winter, so we may have to rethink that. Other plants uh, uh, in that Aureliaceae family, like um, Fapsias, Dendropanics, we're really excited about. We got a great Dendropanics that this winter showed not the slightest bit of damage. It makes a nice low mound. Really, really impressed with it. Uh, maples, this Acer Pentaphyllum, it's one of the rarer maples around. Um, it's, it's severely, severely endangered in China. So we, working with some other uh, gardens, have been have been um, growing these out, seeing how they perform. Did not do so well after this winter. We're waiting to see which ones will will come back. We've got about seven different um, uh, collections of this. And sometimes you collect, you get lucky. Collected seed of a uh, of the um, Critagus uh, leaf um, maple. And uh, we saw them growing and noticed uh, as it got older, it started getting these brilliant orange gold stems. Uh, so we have uh, gotten that propagated and we're evaluating that and that may be something that, that gets um, released to the nursery industry. Not just from the wild, but also from collections um, at other places. This is Euonymus macropterus. We think that's the species, not 100% sure. But those fruits are about four inches from wing to wing. So definitely ornamental. And of course, we look at our collections that we've been growing, and sometimes things that we've been growing for a long time we realize are amazing. One JC named was this uh, fantasy crepe myrtle. He named it for its very upright uh, habit. It makes it a great street tree. Um, you know, and, and it it, t it took quite a few years in the ground to be able to see that um, that form. Another one that we've released recently is this um, Chinese red bud, Kay's Early Hope, named for Kay Yao, uh, the women's basketball coach who, who passed away. Um, this is a plant we've had for, you know, over a decade at the Arboretum, and we've been watching it and thinking it's very good, but we finally, um, we finally started propagating it, putting a name on it, um, it is the first, one of the first red buds to flower for us, and generally the last to finish. It is such a long blooming plant. Uh, a lot of interest from the nursery industry on this one. Um, but it's not just plants. Um, sometimes we, we talk about plants as well as just grow the plants and distribute the plants. Um, we do a lot of different education um, type of programs. Uh, children's programming is one of our newest things. Uh, we're really um, doing a lot of that. Every year it grows by um, you know, dozens of, of programs in, in that. We do trips with our members and, and volunteers, both internationally, this is in England, but also uh, you know, long weekends and day trips and things like that. Of course, we have lots of, lots of um, Education programs, lectures, monthly lectures, uh, workshops, doing more and more workshops, propagation workshops, and wreath making workshops, and pruning workshops, and all those sorts of things. 
So uh, we have all these plans, we talk about all these plans, and then we spread all the wealth around. Uh, we have our big gala in the garden every year. That's the first Sunday in May. Uh, mark your calendars. Tickets are still available. This is a fundraiser, so it's about a $100 ticket, but there's um, free alcohol and food and wonderful plants and other things to bid on. Um, well, I'm hoping those two are bidding against each other. We get the price uh, up there, but you get some great yields on some phenomenal plants. We also, of course, have plant sales. Uh, this was our, our plant sale this year. Generally around the, the first weekend in um, April is uh, when we do our plant sales. Members get 20% discount, so if you're a master gardener and you're a member, 20% uh, discount. We also have some programs where we distribute plant to uh, connoisseur plants to our high-level donors, high-level members. Um, and volunteers who have logged in a certain number of hours. These are some of the really good things. And I mentioned the index seminar, the seed list that, that uh, different botanical institu institutions do. Uh, we just a few years ago started sending seed out to an index seminar. Uh, we had been just, just bringing seed in that way, but now we started sharing the wealth as well. And of course, we love to have nurserymen come in and take cuttings and propagate plants because uh, that's what we're here to do. We're here to support the nursery industry. So they can come in, um, but we also distribute plants at the summer uh, North Carolina Nursery Landscape Association show. We bring plants in and uh, distribute them to um, the various nurserymen and uh, then get their feedback on plants that they think have potential, plants that they want to add to their mix. Uh, uh, the ones that they think are dogs, uh, we do a lot of that. And then the one that, that really we get a lot of press for is our, our members giveaway, Friends of the Arboretum giveaway. Uh, people start lining up to crack a dawn, first Saturday in October, put it on your calendar. If you're a member, um, you can join that day if you'd like, but if you're a member, you can come uh, and uh, we distribute about um, anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 plants uh, free to our members. Uh, I don't know if I can play this. doesn't look like it. You can go on YouTube and, um, and uh, see a video. Um, look up J.C. Ralston Friends Distribution and you can see a video of uh, the, the distribution. It's a lot of fun. Um, but we give away just thousands and thousands of plants. And, uh, you know, the people who've been coming a long time know to bring their wagons and carts so they can get the plants out of there. Um, occasionally we just give plants away to people. We'll, we'll put some plants out and let them take them. Uh, this is an old sign, um, but it still holds true today. Uh, the key to that sign is that very last line. We're, if we're giving them away that way, we don't know what they are, don't ask us, because if we knew what they were, we probably wouldn't give them away. So um, my personal motto, life is too short for boring plants. Um, I am more than happy to take uh, questions. I don't know what's the easiest way to do that, maybe the little uh, raised hand um, Thing so we don't have people talking at once. And uh, uh, Lucy, you can kick me off whenever I've, I've run out of, out of uh, time for, for questions. Will do. But we do have plenty of time for questions right now. You guys can ask the, the questions. If you've got a mic, go ahead and ask it with the mic, or you can use the chat box to put questions in through the chat box. And Mark, is there, you're saying that the Master Gardeners get access to, to some of the material that's on the website. Is there a password that they need to know or, or anything special they need to know about how to log in to get that information or is it all out there for the, for the public so they don't need? Well, um, I'd have to double check that because we just started a new website. I think um, 
what's available on our website is a uh, a small size image um, that would be too small to use for for most anything. But if it's for an education program, you can get in touch with um, with us here at the Arboretum. Um, uh, Nancy DeBrava, who does our interpretive horticulture, or Chris Glenn, our education manager, and uh, they can get you the access to the full size image. Um, extension agents can log in using their um, their university uh, Unity ID and password, so they can get get in that way. Okay, thank you. I see you have a question in the chat from Sean Banks. Where was the most interesting place you went to collect plants? Um, good question. I, I guess um, for me, the most interesting place was New Zealand, just because that was on my bucket list. And I probably would not have gone there to collect plants, but I was invited to, a, to do a lecture there. So if you're going to do a you know 17-hour flight, you might as well stay for a little bit of time and and uh, and do the collect what collecting you can. Um, I I love Japan. Uh, they've in the nurseries there. They've got the most phenomenal plants. But I just I love the culture. I love the food. Um, really like everything about it uh, there. So um, those would be two of two of my tops. Wasn't so much collecting. I did a little bit of collecting, but I also spent about a month in Ecuador living with uh, uh, the Chachi people, um, which was a native uh, group there. Um, so that was uh, that was pretty uh, pretty interesting, uh, pretty different. That that picture of the iguana was from from that tribe down in Ecuador, and we did eat the iguana. I, I see another um, question about hardiness zone. Do we typically collect for? Uh, we're, we are aiming for zone seven, uh, which is where we are here in you know kind of central Piedmont. Some of what we collect is uh, not quite hardy enough for for zone seven. Some of it we find is much is very very hardy, which is why we share plants around so people we can get some evaluations. Uh, we, you know, people sometimes scratch their heads when I say Taiwan because if they know anything about Taiwan, they know it is um, subtropical or, or tropical, uh, and that is true. They grow all around the island. They're growing, um, you know, pineapples and mangoes, uh, but that's along the coastline. And the highest peak in Taiwan is um, bumping right up against 16,000 feet. So. We do our collecting in Taiwan between about 3,500 feet and about uh, 8,500 feet, and that's where you're really getting into that um, that temperate zone for zone seven and, and colder. Oh, see another question. Aside from the ruby, um, the little ruby, what are some of the more recent plant releases from the arboretum? Um, well, I will. Little Ruby's not Arboretum release. That's a NC State, NC, uh, NCNLA release. Um, from the Arboretum itself, um, we have uh, have recently released uh, a new variegated uh, Stachyurus or spike tail called Carolina Parakeet, which was a, a sport from Magpie. Magpie was a variegated Stachyurus that's terrible. It's a terrible grower. Very showy, but and it's beautiful if you live in England, but it's not a good grower for the southeast. Um, but we got a, a, saw a sport on that that's a little more subtle of a variegation, and it does so well here for us. Really vigorous, one we really like. Um, Denny Werner's uh, red buds were released uh, through the arboretum. Um, so Ruby Falls, the weeping purple leaf red bud, and White Water, the variegated weeping one. Um, I mentioned the uh, uh, double flowered um, Texensis type is is um, hitting the market this season. Um, so those are some of the ones that that we get uh, really excited about. But there's a few other things that we're still evaluating and looking at, and hope to release uh, soon. Other questions? Okay, well, Mark, if, if somebody was asking a question, I, I 
could not get it. Um, I saw well, Joe and Dare had her microphone on, but I didn't didn't hear anything. Um, Mark, many thanks for for coming and sharing all this information about the amazing things that are happening at the Arboretum. Um, if you guys think of questions later, you can reach Mark at the the Arboretum, um, and we'll have to have him back again. Uh, Mark, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me, Lucy. I always love talking to um, master gardeners and, and uh, all the folks in Extension because that's um, you know the the way we get all this information out to everybody is is uh, through those conduits. So, always love talking to the groups. Um, you know, always happy to come talk to master gardeners uh, if if schedule, my schedule allows. I get kind of busy at some times a year, um, but please, uh, if you ever have questions, um, don't hesitate to to send them my way. That's uh, that's part of of what I do, and I'm always happy to do it. So, thanks so much for having me. Ready. Let's see. This that's Matt stuff. Um, Mark, Mark Blevins, welcome, Mark. Good morning. Thank you very much. Oh, Mark Wethington, everybody. Yeah. Hey, so. <laughs> we sometimes call statistical outliers anomalies, but today's showstopper is so unique, it's shenomalies. Oh dear. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> so, oh, tonight, today, so anytime I say storm, make your best thunderclap impersonation. Ready? Storm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this right here is a new introduction from the breeding program of Dr. Tom Rainey at NC State. These quinces are not like the flowering quinces found in Grandma's garden. These jokers, the old ones, had a few flowers at the bottom, they had thorns and fruits that you didn't really want to eat, but now, pink storm and scarlet storm are coming your way from Dr. Tom Rainey. So scarlet storm has flowers all up and down the stems. They're thornless, they're fruitless, and they're double. The old flowers on your grandma's quince might make 12 petals. This one we're looking at 25. Show all your friends, amaze them, and best of all, these will grow in part sun to full sun, reaching a height from four to six feet. And this is one of those ironclad plants that needs very little maintenance after it gets established. Be on the lookout for this scarlet storm. Quince and other sister NC State introductions, pink storm and orange storm. OK, that was the last one. Showstoppers is a partnership between Cooperative Extension and the North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association to make sure that great plants get into the hands and gardens of great gardeners like yourselves across the Carolinas. Thanks to Lucy, John Vining, and everybody else involved in that. Have a great Plants, Pests, and Pathogens Day. Thanks, Mark. Next up is Matt Bertone. In addition to being an incredibly knowledgeable entomologist, Matt is an extraordinary photographer. If you have not found Matt's Flickr site, you're missing out. You need to go to flickr.com and, and look up Matt and uh, all the amazing images. If you subscribe to his Flickr site, then every time you log on to your Flickr site, you'll get new um, images. You'll see new images from, from Matt. Um, Matt, welcome. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, um, I have to apologize. Um, I'm com coming off of a sickness right now, so I may uh, some of my words might get uh, not uh, they might come might come out strangely. <laughs> I'm uh, trying to speak well, um, but thank you for the introduction and thank you for um, the promo for the uh, for my Flickr. Um, I'm actually going to start out with a couple of photos. I, I just got a new lens and I love taking photos with this. This is a wide-angle lens, so I'm going to show you some spring highlights I use this lens for. Um, and I'm also under, I'm in with Mike right now, so you won't see me logged in as a moderator, but I'm, I'm me and Mike are in the same desk right now. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes, okay. we can hear you great. Great. 
Okay, so um, some string highlights. So um, last time I told you to be on the lookout for bees, solitary bees, ground nesting bees. Well, we had uh, calls from several people and several of our faculty uh, finding these bees nesting in their ground, uh, in their yards. This is actually a typical habitat right here. Uh, very sparse vegetation with some open ground, uh, open soil, and you see all these holes. Each one of them has a tunnel uh, with, a, with a bee female making, its, uh, making little cells in it. And uh, so I, I, I got a call. I, I, uh, one of our faculty members, Mike Walvogel, told me about this house and had it. I went over there with my new lens and laid in the patch of bees and, you know, most people that would send them into nightmares. But um, actually these are very docile bees. None try to sting me or anything. They're not like that. Um, but I got some really kind of cool shots. It took me a while, but this is one of my favorites of the shots um, of a bee emerging from one of the holes. And you can see that this is actually in an urban setting. These, are, these cars are parked right next to the area where they were, where they were buzzing around. Um, this is probably the female. The males are the ones buzzing around looking for females to mate with. Of course, the males can't sting, so you don't have to be worried about them. But like I said, very docile. They kind of just waited there. If I was laying around their tunnel, when I would move to another area, they would kind of come out, pop their heads out, everything like that. Uh, now, speaking of bees also, um, I took this picture in my front yard yesterday. Uh, this is a carpenter bee, so when they're not ruining your wood, uh, they are out there pollinating. They're collecting pollen for their, their cells inside the wood. Um, and this is a nice big female that was on an iris in my front yard. Um, so again, this wide angle lens lets you take pictures of them close up, but also gets a lot of the background in the shot, which is kind of nice for to see the environment. Uh, lastly, uh, for my daughter's birthday, we went to Marbles downtown in Raleigh. And they have this nice little garden there. And there's this really nice, pretty silver spotted skipper uh, butterfly uh, flying around. Um, and uh, so these lay eggs, and the larvae feed on legumes. So they'll be on wisteria, sometimes soybeans. That's where I've seen them before. Uh, the larvae are very beautiful yellow with red headed caterpillars that lay, uh, lay in little rolled up leaves, which they tie together with silk like many other uh, skipper butterflies. Um, so basically the adults were active about a, you know, a couple weeks ago. So we're going to start to see the young larvae soon. And uh, luckily they don't do a lot of damage. There's not very many of them per plant. Um, but if you find one of these large larvae, you know that that's going to turn out to be that kind of pretty skipper butterfly, fairly large uh, for a skipper. OK, so now into some of our subjects. Uh, so it's April, but the March flies are out. Um, this is a group of flies that I really like. Um, they're kind of interesting. This, uh, we got a sample in earlier this week from Alabama, actually, uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, this kind of spurred me to talk about these flies that are going to be flying around. They're on people's homes. Uh, they're just all over the place, basically. Uh, they're in the family Bibionidae. And there are three subfamilies, Bibionine, Plesioine, and Hesperonine. The Hesperonine is a really interesting, <clears throat> sometimes placed in its own family. And it's a very rare Western North American genus, uh, which is, if you can find one, I'd be delighted. It would be on my bucket list, basically. But otherwise, these very common March flies are often emerging in the spring. That's why they're called March flies. And they can uh, form swarms in large masses of them. Um, the, they, the females and males are usually tied together at the ends, basically, for long, experience, long extended periods of time when they're mating. Uh, and this is when people notice them more often. Um, now, one thing you might notice here, this is a mating pair, obviously, is that there's kind of a difference in how they look. Uh, these insects are highly dimorphic as males and females. So um, if you see in these pictures, the males on the left have these very huge eyes that take up most of the head. Um, the females, on the, other, on the other hand, on the right side, have much smaller eyes and much no, more normal looking head. Now, males have this holoptic appearance, which is a, a technical term for having the eyes basically touching or taking up most of the head. 
Um, and this is probably used to swarm when they swarm and they lek. The males will swarm around in an area and they'll they'll look out for females to mate with that are flying by. The females, of course, are not doing that, so they have this dicoptic or separated eye um, type of situation. Um, and uh, most of the ones I'll be showing you are males, but the females are fairly common too. I found a couple in my house just the other day even. Okay, so most of the ones you're going to be seeing out are the Bibio on the right, or Dilophus, some of them on the left. These are the typical Bibion, Bibionines. These are the ones that are going to come out earlier in the, in the early spring to early summer. Um, the, uh, basically, the main differences between these two groups is that, uh, that Bibio has these large spurs on the front legs, this very large uh, spur. And that's what the females especially use those to dig into the soil to lay their eggs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Dilophus, on the other hand, has kind of these long rakes. They're kind of just a lot of spines around the, around the uh, end of the tibia. Uh, both of these groups are kind of a little harder and shinier than in the next group. And of course, both of these right here are males. You can see they have these very large eyes. Uh, the next group, the Plesiini, are a little bit more delicate. They are a little bit more velvety, they seem. And of course, again, these are both males. You see the large eyes in the head. Um, but the two main genera are Plesia and Penthetria. Uh, Plesia has two species in the southeast. Uh, this one I was fortunate enough to take a picture of in, in a park in Cary. This is a male of Plesia americana, which is our native species. Um, and there were actually no photos on Bug Guide of that, so this is the first photo on Bug Guide of them. Uh, the other one, that, which actually came out, and I took photos of the male and female, as you saw before, uh, in the fall, is uh, Penthetria heteroptera. We only have one species of that. It's not very common. But it can be found, and I was just at, out at somebody's house for a Halloween party, and there was a mating pair on the side. So they are unlike the other March flies that typically come out in the spring and early summer that are going to be out during the fall. Now, the problem with March flies is they sometimes become pests. So the larvae, like all flies, are legless. They don't have any true legs on their thorax. Um, and are kind of worm-like. Well, you notice that they all have these, uh, these, these um, March fly larvae have these little projections all over their body. It's kind of the one way, especially also with their dark black, well-sclerotized or well-hardened head, to identify them. Now, they feed usually on decaying vegetable matter. So if you have a compost pile just sitting on the grass, something like that, they're going to be in there. But they're also known to live in soil and rich organic material in soil, which also contains plants. So this could be your lawn or a field with uh, wheat. And what they will do then also is start to feed on the roots of the grass um, or the crop. And they can become a serious problem sometimes. But because they're very ephemeral, they're only going to be present uh, for a short period of time doing this damage. Um, Basically, there's not a lot that you can do, um, so chemical control is really not warranted. You may find them in large groups, but they have a fairly quick life cycle, and the damage will be over fairly quickly. Um, now, like I said, this, uh, this one on the top came from Alabama. This is a Plesia, uh, probably a Plesia neoarctica, which is an introduced species. And that becomes an issue in other ways. Uh, this was actually found in a turf farm. And they said there were uh, 20 individuals per 5 square centimeters. So they can be very high densities. You can see here Jim Baker took a nice photo of, uh, of these larvae right here in some soil. Now, these plesia can become problems in other ways, especially if you are from Florida or, in, or around the Gulf states. You may know the infamous love bugs. Um, Plesia neoarctica, which when they emerge, they mass emerge as adults. And like I said, they'll be, the males and females will be mating end to end for long periods of time. And they become kind of a nuisance uh, to people on golf courses or places around these types of uh, turf areas. 
Um, but and they can also swarm homes, come in homes, but they're really a nuisance when you're driving because they can swarm so much that they basically block your view. They can be smeared on the windshield when you use the windshield wipers. And apparently their body contents are kind of acidic, which can actually start to dissolve the paint on cars. So luckily we don't have this species uh, this far north really. There are reports of them being as far north as Wilmington or near the coast, but not very common in North Carolina. Uh, but as you get down into Georgia and Florida and Alabama, you're going to get a lot of these things emerging. So that's marsh flies. Um, and um, our next subject is one that I uh, encountered again by chance. Um, I was in the parking lot of a big kind of just uh, parking lot with a lot of stores, targets. I was actually going to lunch. Um, and in one of the islands, there was a nice ash tree that was uh, leafing out, very small leaves coming out. And on it, um, there were a lot of these wasps that I saw. And uh, so I grabbed a bag, I grabbed a cup, and I just collected a bunch of them. And it turned out to be this brown-headed ash sawfly. Um, it's in the family Tenthridinidae, which are the common sawflies. And it's uh, the species Temps Tomostethus multisynctus. This is the only member of the genus in North America. It actually has a European counterpart that also feeds on European ash. Um, and um, the larvae of the North American one feed on green or red ash, white ash, or Oregon ash. And they're actually known from the east and then the west coast. And there were some questions as to whether they were introduced to the west coast from the east. But the uh, collection records are so far back that it may just be a fairly widespread species. Or at least there's no point in arguing now because they're everywhere. Uh, it is not very common all the time. And apparently the adults are not commonly collected. Most of the time they have to be reared. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to collect about a dozen individuals. And here's a nice uh, picture of just what one of them looks like. Now, they're not typical wasps. They're, they're sawflies. They're primitive type wasps. So they don't sting. Uh, they're not of uh, medical concern. But the larvae are going to be like other sawfly larvae in that they will feed on the plants and start to defoliate the leaves. So they're called brown-headed uh, soft, uh, ash sawflies, not because the adults have brown heads, but because the larvae, although it's hard to see here, are a pale yellow-green with a brownish to yellowish head. Um, now the young larvae make these little shot holes in the leaves. And as they get older, they start to defoliate the leaves more and eat from the edges. So the females were probably laying eggs or waiting for the leaves to get to the right stage to lay eggs in the leaves. This can cause deformities in the leaves. Um, and then the larvae hatch in about May or June and feed, start feeding on the leaves. Now, then they, after, after they're done feeding, they climb down the tree and become pre pupae in the soil, which means they're kind of a resting state larva that's about to pupate. And this is how they overwinter. And then when the spring comes, they complete their pupation and then become adults, pop out of their uh, pupil case, and climb up the trees or fly to the trees, and uh, basically then start the whole life cycle over again. Now, as far as if you're seeing these on your ash trees, of course, We've got bigger concerns with emerald ash borer coming into the state uh, for ash trees than this brown-headed ash sawfly, but it's good to know. Um, basically, the defoliation rarely kills the trees. This is the spring uh, leafing out. Um, culture control may help. So they're not very strong larvae. So spraying them off with a hose or picking them off if they're not, not a very large tree or you've got masses of them on lower limbs you basically pick them off by hand. Um, now, other common herbivore ingested pesticides will kill the larvae. These are ones that you typically use for caterpillars on trees. Um, and you'll want to focus the spray where the larvae are present. But otherwise, if you're not uh, too worried about a very mature ash tree um, being defoliated a little bit in the spring, 
these these larvae will be there. They'll do their thing, and they'll basically um, finish uh, their feeding and pupate. Um, I'm assuming midsummer or so. But just an interesting uh, insect that I had, not, I had not encountered, and I I really like, enjoy sawflies, especially the adults. Um, uh, but of course, they're sometimes a concern, and uh, they can be uh, worrisome to people, especially being protective of their ash trees. Like okay, last subject I'm going to talk about is one that I'm revisiting because the last time we talked about it was four years ago, and uh, it's a very common pest. And um, basically, there might be some new people here that might not know about this, but this is the boxwood leaf miner. Now there was a little story uh, by Steve Frank in the uh, North Carolina Pest News article recently, but I wanted to just to show you some of the things um, that I've seen and just uh, give you a general overview. Um, this is a gall midge, a fly in the family Cicidomyidae. It's named as Monarther palpus flavus. And I noticed them in a new house I moved into. Uh, we have a couple of variegated boxwoods, and as I was walking inside, I saw all these little flies swarming around them this week. And so this is the time where they're active, the adults are active. Um, they're specific to Buxus species, and um, they uh, attack uh, variable, uh, different varieties at variable rates. Um, it was introduced in the, from Europe into the U.S. and does pretty well here. It's a very, very common pest of boxwood, one of the most common. Luckily, it has one generation per year, but the, the insect does uh, cause damage throughout the year. Now, like I said, these flies, I wanted to get a video, but I wasn't able to yet, but I probably will still uh, get a video of them uh, swarming. Now, there were dozens of them swarming around a moderate-sized bush. Um, this week. And so the adults are looking to mate. This is a male. Um, it's uh, hard to tell from this picture. The females have a long ovipositor which they use to insert eggs into the tissue. And they fly this time of year around the bushes because this is when the new growth, the new uh, tender growth is happening. And this is where they're going to be laying their eggs. Now after the eggs are laid, the larvae hatch. And these are late in star larvae, so very older larvae, but in, early, uh, in the late spring, early summer, you're going to have these smaller larvae than this um, mining in the very thick leaves of the boxwood. And at first, you may not notice anything, but later on, you're going to notice some blister galls or some blister mines, basically, in the leaves. They look like little uh, bubbles, kind of. And the next picture, the next slide, I'll show you some of the late, late um, stage uh, galls. Um, now these these uh, flies will feed throughout the summer and pupate o or, and uh, live over winter as older larvae. And they'll become fairly inactive over winter. And then when it, the spring hits, they'll speed up and they'll basically pupate. Now um, here is a box what I got last year. You can see here are these blister galls, or uh, the, basically the leaf mines. And this is right as the pupae were forming. And you can see here's the pupa. It's kind of fly-like, but kind of larva-like, bright orange. And uh, basically what happens is when they pupate in this blister, uh, right before that, you're going to have these little windows that appear. And um, what they'll do is they'll pupate in that blister. The little window up here, and when it's time for them to emerge as adults, and that's just a couple weeks ago was happening, uh, you'll get uh, these the pupil skins, the, the pupae will wiggle out of these little windows in the blisters, and then the adults will wiggle out of the skins and leave the little skins under the box. Uh, this photo was by Steve Frank in our department, and uh, I haven't observed this yet, but I'd like to. Um, but once they're out of these skins, they're going to go find new hosts. And uh, that's what we're seeing now. And that completes the life cycle. So basically, um, things you can do are uh, during, during this time of year when the adults are flying, you can spray the plants with pyrethroids. 
um, to prevent them from landing on the bushes. But this might all actually create uh, mite outbreaks because boxwood mite is another important pest, very common to boxwoods, creates stippling damage on the leaves. Um, but uh, so you want to be careful about that. Otherwise, if you can wait and you don't catch this period of the adult flight, you can use uh, systemics such as Mar Marath Marathon, TriStar, or, or Esliprin. Um, as a soil drench, um, basically late spring, early summer, while the larvae are feeding in the in the leaves. Now you also want to watch out for um, Steve Frank mentioned this in the pest news. Watch out! You might want to apply the systemics after the flowers have come out, so that you don't kill any pollinators or anything that are coming from flowers. Uh, lastly, online you can find there are a few boxwood varieties that have some resistance to the boxwood leaf miner, um, but uh, I, it's, there's a variable lists online that, that, that say which ones. Um, I did not see any actually overpositing on my variegated boxwoods in my front yard, but um, and I did not see much damage from last year, but I'll have to see it over time as that if that develops if there's developed some uh, blister galls. Okay. Um, so lastly, um, things. Oh, and also, if you want to, you can also wait for some of the things like this crab spider to eat the adults while they're flying around the boxwoods. But I don't think that that's going to completely solve the problem. But luckily, there are these predators around eating the adults um, and reducing the population. So because they do swarm around the boxwood, they may be conspicuous to other predators and th to predators and things like that. Um, just something to note. OK. So lastly, um, some things to be on the lookout for. I saw on the, while I was walking around here seeing the neighborhood, I saw on the road a squished eastern tent caterpillar, eastern tent caterpillar. That means they're active right now. And uh, this is the time of year when they're usually active. And uh, they're going to be starting to make webs in the crooks of trees. Uh, so basically, uh, the larvae are out right now. They're going to start doing this. And they're going to start defoliating the leaves. Uh, things you can do are to basically pull down or destroy the webs mechanically with a stick or uh, a pruning pole. Uh, it is not advisable to burn any of these uh, tents um, because obviously that can have um, unanticipated consequences. If you're going to use chemical controls, it's best to spray close to where these tents are because that's the foliage that the larvae are going to be eating. Um, and you may notice in May or June, the adults coming out and they're these very small, cute, fuzzy uh, moths with these two stripes on their, uh, on their wings. Uh, that's the tank caterpillar um, adults. Now their eggs, I didn't put a picture in of their eggs, but their eggs are very distinct. And one method too is to, after the adults are done laying their eggs, just to prune those branches off. And what happens is they lay these kind of strange eggs that, that um, look almost like a foam or bubble mass around encircling small twigs uh, on their host plants. So if you see these kind of very strange, you can look them up online. I have some pictures of them too um, that I think I've put in previous presentations. But um, if you see those branches with those eggs, you can prune them off and that will keep them from uh, hatching next year. Also, um, at my old house, I noticed, uh, this was several years ago, uh, the hickory, hickories, and this also happens on pecans, will start to grow their leaves out. And when the leaves develop more fully in May and June, you may get these round leaf or stem galls containing aphids. Now, these aphids are in the family Phylloxeridae. Uh, they are in the genus Phylloxera. And um, they may look like a, a disease or some other kind of gall. Uh, but when you cut them open, you'll see all these, uh, basically a colony of aphids, the winged the alate aphids here, I think, are males. Uh, and you have these other ones. Some, oftentimes, if you cut it open really early, you'll get one large female 
that's laying eggs in the in the gall that hatch in the more young. Um, though they may be worrisome and you may you may see them all over some stems or on the leaves, they're more aesthetic than destructive. Um, there's also the um, the saving grace that some years they're worse than others. Uh, you may see them a lot this year and not at all next year. Um, and from tree to tree, you may see ones, trees that have a lot of them and trees that don't have any. So just be on the lookout. You can always pop one of these galls off the leaf, cut it open, and see what's inside. If there's an aphid or a colony of aphids, this yellowish uh, color ones with these yellow, brown, gray winged aphids, uh, that's going to be this, this phyloxer gall. Um, so just be aware of those. And lastly, uh, everybody's favorite, mosquitoes are going to be out soon. So tis the season for blood feeding. Uh, hopefully, you avoid them this year. There aren't, aren't too many, but we'll have to see. Uh, it depends on how wet it's going to be this year, uh, because obviously mosquitoes depend on wet uh, um, temporary pools of water to lay eggs uh, for their larvae to live in. Um, so. Most of the ones you're going to be seeing around are going to be these small Asian tiger mosquitoes, the really vicious small ones that are flying around everywhere. They're particularly good at um, inhabiting small containers. So basically, if you can keep dumping out water from flower pots, uh, saucers, bird baths, things like that, or using uh, BT or some um, um, alphacid or some uh, insect growth regulators that can help reduce the populations. Hopefully you don't have many of the large uh, sclerophora, which are probably three or so times bigger than the small Asian tiger mosquitoes. Luckily they're not very common, but if they do land on you, you are going to be running for your life uh, because they're very large. Now on that note, if you do see another, a very large mosquito around, you may not want to kill every single one of them because some of them are good. So uh, be on the lookout for, a, uh, for the elephant mosquitoes, which are these very large, uh, here's a female and here's a male, these very large iridescent blue, very pretty mosquitoes that are uh, very easily identified by their curved proboscis. You know, this male and this goldenrod has this very nice curved proboscis. They are the largest mosquitoes we have, and that comes from the fact that they get a very high protein diet of other mosquito larvae as, as young. So they'll live in a, in a puddle or a small pond with other mosquito larvae, and they consume many other mosquito larvae in that puddle. And because they get all this protein as young, the adults don't need to feed on blood. The females do not need to feed on blood as adults. So they're not going to bite you. Um, and so if you see one of these on a flower and you're saying, oh, kill it, it's a mosquito, just be aware that every one of these you kill are less of them to help control other mosquitoes. And they're very beautiful, I think, for mosquitoes. And they also contribute to pollination as this male here is showing. Um, so that's it for me right now. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. And uh, if not, we'll... Uh, get Mike on here to uh, present about some uh, pathogens. This is Mike uh, back with you. I don't know if you noticed the new computer smell while Matt was doing his presentation, but we're working on a machine that was just installed yesterday, so I had a little bit of a moment of anxiety wondering if it was going to be up and running properly, but it was, so things seemed to be working well at our end, and I assume that you would have complained if they hadn't been at yours. I'm going to start out by stretching our collaborate muscles a little bit and encouraging some participation from you, the viewers. And to start out, I want to mention a tool that we don't often use, which is the text label. 
And if you'll notice, toward the left center of your screen, if you haven't changed the layout, there is a little toolbar. And one of those icons will be something to do with the letter A. Now, it may be an A with some lines below it, or it may be just the straight letter A. And if it's the lined version, go ahead and click on it and change it over to the simple letter A for a simple text label and get ready to do this next exercise. What I'm going to ask you to do, and by way of a poll, let us know the experience level of the different Master Gardener volunteers that are present. So you're going to have to type in several numbers if you've got a room full of people with different levels of experience. But for example, if you have a set of three Master Gardeners with two to five year experience, you click on that A and then over in that column, you'll write your number three and click away from it and then the number stays there on the whiteboard. Now one interesting feature here is this will allow participation anonymously so that no one will know who typed in that number. Well you know that I typed it in this case because I was talking but we won't know where that came from but we'll still get an idea from you folks in this case on a poll but in other cases trying to guess at a uh, for example a disease or other Test issues. So let me go ahead and remove my three here and let you go to it. The downside of this, of course, is I won't know when people are done because Wow, our group is very heavily weighted toward a lot of experience. Is that a 2 and a 4 or is that a 24? That's a 24. I can grab these and rearrange them too. All right, and I see this box here. Again, we don't know who it was, so your anonymity is secure. It uh, looks like you may have had the tool with the multi-line text box on it, which is why it looks a little different from the others. OK, this is great. This, um, this is very interesting, and I'm glad that everybody seemed to be able to get the hang of it. If not, Chime in in the chat box and maybe one of our uh, other moderators can help walk you through it. Meanwhile, let's get on with the program. And I decided today to take a look mostly at things that are not actually diseases. We do talk a lot about diseases here, and that's what pathologists get excited about, and cycles and vectors and sporulation and infection and so on. But a lot of our problems are due to non-infectious disorders. And in most cases, those mean one of two things, either something that Mother Nature did or something that we, the gardener, were responsible for. So I'm going to take a look at several of these, which you may be encountering with the folks who are, uh, are calling in. And with as much experience as I see you've got, this may be of um, sort of a review rather than any new information. This photograph was from the front yard of Dr. Chuck Hodges, who is our tree expert and mold expert in the clinic. And he had these recently transplanted Japanese hollies that were not thriving. And of course, he brought them into the clinic. Turned out that they did not have disease on them. Like this actually might have been the second planting already that they replaced it. So knowing that it wasn't disease is helpful because you know that you can try again with the same plant. And it turned out that the issue was hydrophobic soil and high salts. Hydrophobic soil or hydrophobic planting media 
it's actually more common with your artificial planting media, occur when microorganisms cause soil particles to become water resistant rather than water absorptive. Hydrophobic, of course, meaning that it, uh, it sheds water so that the plant's roots will not get the moisture that they need. And at the same time, as you might imagine, that water not being able to leach through, there was an accumulation of probably fertilizer salts, although in cases like this after winter like we had, you'll want to ask if people were using de-icing salts at all. But accumulation of salts in the soil that led to the stress on these plants, the combination then of two different soil factors. And he did eventually get his shrubs to establish at this location with, um, with I think, the third try. As far as I know, there are not any wetting agents that you would want to use for trying to deal with hydrophobic soils, but um, the, one of the things that you can do to make sure that you don't have as much of a problem when you transplant something that came in somewhat hydrophobic media, I'll mention later when we talk about transplanting issues. All right, another abiotic or non-living problem that we can get on our woody ornamentals and trees is hail damage. And we're going to be now entering the season where we're going to get these towering thunderstorms and threats of severe weather, and including hail. And those, of course, are obvious when they first occur. You'll see the shredded leaves laying all over the ground. But it may not be obvious if you're looking at the damage months or years later, what originally happened. So the thing to look for would be wounds, either length, uh, elliptical, elongate wounds on one side of the stem, the side that was, was facing upward on the tree at that moment. And they can heal over after time, but they can also be sites of infection for our plant pathogens. So they are not necessarily innocuous from the long-term perspective. Cold injury. This was uh, something that struck me as interesting when I first started working in the clinic back in the 90s when we were diagnosing cold injury in August on woody ornamentals. And of course, the injury itself had occurred back during the winter months, but the plants were showing enough stress because of that injury when we reached summer and the higher temperatures and greater water demand. The key diagnostic symptom when you are looking for cold injury is a splitting of the bark, usually near the base of the plant. And I'll say why in a minute. It's often on one side of the stem only and then can lead to a general decline in the summer once the plant is under stress. And the reason that the splitting is usually near the base of the stem is because that is the portion that's the last to go dormant in the fall and the first to become active again in the spring. So if you've got a cold temperature that occurred early in the fall, before the plants had hardened off, or late in the spring after plants have resumed their activity, the place that's going to be most vulnerable is going to be that lower stem. What can you do about this? Well, if it's not on the main stem like this, you can certainly prune them out. So you, a good uh, time to look for this would be around now, and then let the plant regrow. Another issue that we get that isn't a disease, but certainly looks bad enough, is uh, what I'm going to call a container hangover. So this shrub here out of a landscape obviously bears the shape still of the container in which it was grown. You can see the roots growing down the, as if they were growing down the side of the container here and across the bottom of the container there. So that kind of root system is just not going to be adequate once the shrub gets any size on it. And I want to put in here some 
words of wisdom from Dr. Barbara Fair in the horticulture science department on how to deal with transplanting. Now you already know about the the size of the hole you need to dig and so forth that it's wide enough for root expansion. But here is her recommendation. If they're coming out of a container, shave that root ball all the way around and at the bottom about five to ten percent of the of the diameter. That way you'll get rid of some of those problem roots on the edges and hopefully you'll be able to get a better contact between the native soil and the and the root system and that way avoid some of the problems with the hydrophobic media if you've got hydrophobic media in the container when it reaches you. For bald and burlap plants it's a little bit different. You want to take the twine off in the wire basket and then remove the top third to half of the burlap. Now the twine is especially important nowadays because they're using synthetic twines that don't break down in the soil over time so they can be a strangling issue later. Either way, the recommendation now is to not place soil or mulch on top of the root ball. And I'll show a few examples in a moment here of what not to do. I, I pose it as a question, but um, when Barbara and I were out looking at some of these trees on campus, he noticed here that there's no root flare. So that tree just goes straight into the ground, and when I dug around in it with my hand, I went out there this morning, that's just grass from having been recently mowed on the surface there, but I, I had to go fairly deep several inches down and still didn't find where the root flare was. So this plant was planted and or mulched too deeply. I see somebody's pointing there, but it actually goes straight down even into the into the mulch there. A recent video or excuse me, image submission that we got from Pamlico County showed very clearly a couple of these Leyland cypresses that had been set too deep and they seemed to be the ones that were stressed out. Not to say there wasn't a disease issue here too. We only got the photograph and not the physical sample. But the the other possibility you always have to consider in cases like this is were these trees replanted after the loss of the original ones on those spots. And of course as master gardeners you may just be getting a bit of foliage and maybe some twigs if you're lucky and won't be able to see this. So it's another reason why photographs are really helpful in diagnosis. This is a set of uh, loblolly pines that had been transplanted from several, from several years ago now, but where we saw two problems. One was weed eater injury there, and also these roots that are pointing upward, possibly because they had made a hole that was too narrow, stuck the little seedling in there, and the roots ended up being pointed toward the surface. Another symptom that we can see, I didn't put a picture of it, is what we call J-rooting, where the bottom of that root either goes sideways or actually curls up the tap root, and that will cause long-term problems for that tree. The volcano mulching, we've preached against that in the past here on plant pests and pathogens. And you can see that it can sometimes lead to the what are called girdling roots that encircle the stem. And since the uh, root collar, I'm sorry, the uh, the root flare, the base of the stem is buried, then you can get these things where they'll eventually strangle the tree as the diameter increases. And here's an example on campus of of better mulching, where they've left several inches clear around the base of the stem. Not mulching, but I wanted to show this picture in here. If, um, if there were flying deranged beavers, they would probably do something akin to this, but I think this was, again, human error. It was in my neighborhood several years ago, and you can see that uh, the job and the condition of this tree and what its future may be is hard to say. But there was an even, oh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's a story for a few slides ahead. Most of you are probably familiar with the fact that Akuba gets sun scald, these black areas on the leaves if it's not in sufficient shade. 
and I saw a case of that in April. This is with a group that went to Washington the first Saturday of April, and there was sun skull on Akuba there, right in the in the in the shadow of the Capitol, but not enough shade. This is an interesting case right outside the clinic, practically, with these hellebores, and you'll notice that there's a gradient of poor plants to better plants along this row. Now we're going to have folks again offer with the use the text rather than the chat box, use the text tool. It should be right about there. Again, if you haven't reset your screen or reformatted the, the layout, there's a little A. You can just click on this and type your type your idea. And let's see how this looks if it's going to show up on the background here. Uh, put uh, crop circles. All right. I can actually move that down to. I can move that text down here. So type your idea down in the bricks where they can be easily read. No one wants to venture a guess. Big gradient. Okay. That could be, and that was actually my first thought, but when I looked at this bed, I don't think there's going to be that much of a difference from one end to the other, just the way I see the buildings and trees. That could be part of it, but I think there was something else going on. Too much shade on that side. Again, hellebores like shade, so I would say that it was probably too much sun on the poor side rather than too much shade. Kind of too deeply. Um, not sure I didn't look at that. There we go, drainage. I, I think that that's the issue. When I went and grubbed around there, I noticed that the soil at the base of the plants that were doing well was not as wet as the ones that were doing poorly. I and mean, there's a little bit of a downward slope there. And I noticed the same thing on a bed across the sidewalk from this one, where it appeared that the plants that were doing poorly have more moisture around the soil. Now, I don't think it's the chicken and egg situation. You could say, well, a better plant could have drawn more water out of the soil. I suppose that's true, but in this case, I really think it was the fact that there was excess water or poorly draining soil on the left side of this bed, which uh, hellebores don't like and so are doing poorly there. Right, good. It's good to see people participating in the in the new system here. Now, here's the slide that I started to talk about that then uh, didn't realize that I had left it later in the presentation. I have never seen a backstory like this to a clinic sample. This was submitted by Randy Folk in, from Stokes County of a tree outside a home that two years ago had been struck by a car where the driver was texting and driving, ran off the road, hit the tree, the car continued further, stopped three feet short of the house, and burst into flames. And the tree then was damaged not only by the mechanical impact of the vehicle, but also by the heat from the fire. And it also was damaged farther up the trunk and into some of the branches. So the question here wasn't so much what caused the problem, but whether the tree is going to survive or not. And Chuck Hodges, again, who's our, our tree expert in the clinic, looked at this and considered the, the following facts. One is that it happened two years ago and the crown seemed to be doing well. So the tree is leafing out and is able to replenish its reserves, keep itself going, at least has the last couple of years. And so that would be a hopeful sign that it will continue to do so. Another thing that Chuck looked at was the fact that there's the formation of this callus tissue here or new wood being formed, new bark being formed along the edge of the damage. So that's also a sign that the tree has a certain amount of vigor. And 
So there's, um, there is some hope, although it's hard to predict. The greatest danger here really is that since you've got a lot of wood that's exposed, that is a point of entry for wood decay fungi when the spores land on that and can affect, infect you can get a decay column started in the trunk here, which could lead the tree to weaken and break off in a storm. So depending on the distance to the house, you would have to make the decision as to whether that was a risk or not. But apparently the homeowners in this case, because that tree protected their home, are interested in, in maintaining that tree. So the other thing to do here, according to Chuck, would be to continue watching the crown of the tree and seeing if the uh, it starts to show signs of thinning, yellowing, or other signs of stress that it's not going to do well in the long run. While we're on the topic of physical damage, this is an interesting stem from a rhododendron. And if you just looked at this, you might think it was some kind of a canker. But what happened here was there must have been some kind of an injury. I don't know if it was a frost injury or some kind of physical injury that occurred, but then healed over. And the key to understanding whether or not it was a canker versus just a healed wound is scraping the bark off and noticing that that wood is completely healthy. It's very light colored. You can see some green cambium here as well. So there's no sign of what we call necrosis or dead tissue that would indicate an active canker occurring on this branch. One thing that I will not spend any time talking about because it's not my area, but do want to remind folks as they start getting out and about in the garden that they have to be careful with the use of herbicides, both the 2,4-D types used for broadleaf control on lawns and, of course, glyphosate, Roundup, and the other non-Roundup uh, non brands of glyphosate herbicide, which can cause both short and long-term problems on plants, or short-term problems on our herbaceous plants, bedding plants and vegetables, especially tomato, which is so sensitive. And then uh, glyphosate can actually cause damage the following year on woody plants. One other, this one is a living, actually, a, a living situation, but not a disease. Another photograph from Stokes County that Randy sent in. And we don't see the dogwood tree in this case, just this sort of fibrous material that was sent in that came off the trunk. And most of you probably know what this is. These are lichens. It's, we did a program, I think, here in PPMP, yes, on uh, lichens and other trunk and bark dwelling creatures and talked about how they're the crustose type, the folios type, and the fruticose type. Not that they look like fruits, but they are sort of elongate and standing up or out from, from the bark as in the case here. Now remember that these are not causing damage to the tree. They're just using that for support. They are a combination organism of an alga and a fungus. However, they may indicate that there is some other kind of stress on this tree, a little extra light getting through the canopy and so on, and allowing the lichens to thrive. All right, let's try another tool here. Actually, it's the same one that you've been using to register your location in the state when we start the program each by month. And this time, I want to direct your attention to the sunburst tool on that toolbar. It looks like this, or it may already look like one of the other options. If you click on that, you'll see that there's a wide range of choices of pointers to use on the whiteboard. And what I want to do is the following. First, have everybody go to that so you can see the list of options. And then I'm going to ask a question. And depending on the answer, you're going to choose which marker you're going to use on the map. The question is this. Have you seen spot anthracnose on dogwood in your area? If you have seen it this year, then check 
or choose the pointer of the green check mark. If you don't have any dogwoods in bloom in your area, then choose the red X. And if you have dogwoods that are in bloom or have bloomed and they look good, then you're going to choose the smiley face or the surprisey face. Okay, but I'm going to ask you to put them on the map on the next page here. I just wiped out everybody's work, but if you could do it and put it on your location. Don't forget, if you have not had dogwoods bloom in your area because they don't occur, a rare thing that, or because they haven't bloomed yet, then give us a red X on your location on the map. So this, this confirms what I have seen too. I don't think I could find this disease to save my life this year. And I'm not sure why. If it had to do with the cold weather knocked off the timing of the disease cycle, because we certainly had enough moisture at certain points for infection to occur. Uh, Matt behind me here is whispering that he saw it. Um, but uh, <clears throat> ah, okay, I'm um, there. You, I'm not, I don't have any dogwoods. Um, so the, this is a part of the problem with this disease. In terms of people, if they were to want to know about chemical control, it's it's so hard to predict whether you're going to have a good year or a bad year. I've seen it sometimes so bad that it almost looks like frost injury. The petals get so deformed from high numbers of the spots. So it's a, a well again this is a disease that's going to overwinter in twigs or even in fruits and then the infections on the bracts the showy bracts occur in the spring. So an aesthetic disease is not going to be causing serious issues for the long-term health of the plant, but sometimes people ask about it and uh, are upset that their dogwoods look this way. When I did go out and try and see if there was any around here, I ran into this little fellow. So I'm going to actually throw this back at Matt and let him comment. <clears throat> yeah, um, so I didn't mention it because it's fairly obvious that the uh, fall canker worms are out and about. Uh, this happens to be one of the green forms, but we do have I, I, a couple of the samples that were brought to me have uh, lots of the darker forms that are kind of uh, dark uh, brown, black with yellowish um, kind of markings and a, a dark stripe along the back. Um, and uh, like I was warning before, I think last month I said be on the lookout for them. They uh, they are out now and they're going to start defoliating most of the nice tender uh, plants out there. Um, I've been brought in some Maples that have them, the a lot of cherries, the prunus species are going to get them. Uh, here, obviously, the dogwoods, they're very opportunistic, and uh, they're everywhere now. They're going to be hanging down from trees, things like that. Um, let's see. Um, so it's basically one of these things that's going to probably keep happening. We don't know if it will wane next year or whatever, um, but uh, one they'll be out for say a few weeks now and uh, then they'll basically disappear after leaving our trees almost completely defoliated. Now luckily because of the spring um, the trees will have time to recuperate and throw the leaves back. We have a couple of, uh, we have a row of uh, red leaf uh, prunus species cherry trees on our, on our one of our roads in, on uh, campus. It gets defoliated just in the last couple of years and uh, you know, there's no leaves on it or very, you know, chewed up leaves. And then uh, by a month later, they've regrown the leaves and, and they're still around. Um, let's see. Any evidence of natural enemies appearing? Um, no, there will be. I mean, there are obviously going to be opportunistic predators feeding on them. 
Um, I don't know what parasites are attacking them, but they are uh, probably not going to put a dent in the population. Um, the best thing to do will be to wait until um, right before Thanksgiving and ban any of the trees that you really want to save. You really maybe these trees get a lot of uh, of, uh, of defoliation. Uh, basically, the the females will then, after they pupate, after the larvae pupate in the soil, the females will emerge and climb up structures or trees, lay the eggs, and then the larvae will climb up those trees. So if you want to keep the the females from climbing up the trees to lay eggs up near the foliage, you can band them with some sticky bands around the trees. Um, but I don't know of any specific parasites or any other diseases, anything that's actually going to affect the population right now. Um, but let's hope so, um, because uh, it's, it's uh, I've only been in this position since last year, and last year we got a lot of calls. I think this year people will be well aware of what's going on just because um, it has happened before, and and uh, they're pretty obvious. So. Um, Thanks, Matt. I just can't avoid now. Here's here's even in this picture. I didn't notice this until I'd actually already put the picture in the presentation. But there is another one of those little pillars yeah. right there on that pine tree, although probably not needing it. I uh, just want to do mention one or two diseases here at the end. Anybody know what this is? Let's you type in on the whiteboard there with the text tool. Do you know it? A little bit of a swelling at the base of that lolly pine, and then this orange powder coming out. Took this picture yesterday, actually. Yes, very good. Fusiform rust. And here's a picture of a typical fusiform gall. Of course, the word fusiform means spindle shaped, so you notice that it's tapered at both ends and widest in the middle. That helps differentiate it from the pine oak rust, which has a more spherical law. It has the wonderful scientific name of Cornarchium quercum forma specialis fusiformi. The forma specialis are different specialized forms within the species of the fungus. And in this particular photograph, you can see how the, the gall is sporulating. Also in this photograph here, it only sporulates at this time of year, and it does that because this is one of those rusts that alternates between different hosts, although it does have a repeating cycle on its alternate host. The alternate hosts for fusiform rusts are members of the red oak group. Within the pines, it's mostly loblolly and slash are the two that are, that are most affected. And this can cause problems uh, with Weakness in the branches, deformation, if you're trying to raise these trees for wood, it can be a problem because you don't have the nice straight bowl. Infection occurs actually on the needles or on succulent stem tissue. If it's close enough to the main stem where that occurs, then it can move down into the main stem. The reference I read talks about 40 centimeters. So if it's within 40 centimeters of the main stem of the tree that it can move down and infect there. And this is a perennial situation. It's going to complete its life cycle in two or more years. So you can have this as a long-term problem on the individual tree. Actually, in, in my backyard, we had a tree removed that had a large, probably fusiform gall halfway up it. The treatment, if you have it on branches, of course, and it's causing a problem, is just to simply prune those out going well down below the, uh, the gall itself. On oaks, now if you have a really good memory of your PP and P, you will remember that we showed this photograph in August, and there were three different diseases here. There's some oak leaf blister, old oak leaf blister, the burning around the edges is bacterial scorch. But these small spots here, the small necrotic spots, are actually the remains of one of the Cronarchian rusts, probably. Fusiform rust. And you may see at some point in its life cycle hair like almost black structures coming out from the underside of the leaf. 
but again, it doesn't really cause significant damage on the oaks. It's the pines that are the concern. With that, let's just look ahead for the next couple of months, what you'll be wanting to keep your eyes and ears open for. On fruit, this is, of course, just a small selection of the many things that are going to be coming our way, but some things to keep an eye out for will be the peach leaf curl, which is a relative of the oak leaf blister, causing deformation and reddening of leaves. They don't have a picture of that. Peach scab on the developing fruit you can see here can cause splitting of the fruits as they develop. And we might see some fire blight on apple and pear yet as we get into the, the next month. Vegetables, vegetable gardens are going to be starting to really come into their full swing and we'll be seeing problems eventually with downy mildew of cucurbits shown in the lower right photograph here, the angular yellow spot under human conditions showing up with the grayish bluish sporulation. The spots then can also die over time and depending on the year and when the spores blow in, it could be late May, it could be into June before we first start seeing this. One thing of course to keep a close Ion will be the transplants in the garden centers to make sure that they're not bringing it in from other locations. Bacterial spot of tomato and pepper will be coming in and we're probably going to be seeing the first cases of bacterial wilt as well before we meet again in late June. And tomato spotted wilt virus, which as the name implies, causes spotting on the tomato, which might be mistaken for something like a sectoria leaf spot. And we require testing here to be able to really differentiate those two. On our ornamentals, if there are, Chuck asked me this morning, is there black spot left on rose anymore? Well, if you've got some of the older susceptible varieties, there certainly is. Hopefully you did some mulching at the end of the winter to try and reduce this problem or remove the uh, dead leaves. But those that aren't sprayed and are susceptible will be seeing that. Like off the root rot, a continual problem. Powdery mildew on just about everything in the garden that you can think of, on gerberas, on uh, roses possibly, on... Actually, we don't see much powdery mildew on, on rose in the landscape. On euonymus, of course, and a number of other plants. Oak leaf blister, those leaves that are just developing now are going to be susceptible, ripe for infection. Fungus overwintered in and on twigs and buds and will be infecting the newly formed leaves, causing that not really thickened area, but kind of a, a concave blister on the leaf that looks light green at first, but once the fungus sporulates, the center dies. It makes it look like the disease is spreading, but really it's done its job and is no longer producing spores there. That's pictured on the far right here, again, some of these blisters. A cosmetic issue not going to be affecting the long-term health of those trees. Quince Ruth and Ornamental Pear, we talked about it on the junipers last week. Here it is on Ornamental Pear. Usually on the fruit, sometimes you see a stem swelling as well with that. And our different uh, fungal diseases of maples, especially we'll notice those on the Japanese maples where the dark foliage contrasts with the light spots. So you could have something like a philistica here, you could have an anthracnose. And I asked Lee Butler what folks should be looking for in terms of turf diseases coming up. Since the warm season grasses are getting a slow start, we may start to see injury from the winter months in places that were shaded or north facing on the warm season grasses. Large patch disease caused by Rhizotronia solani on the warm season grasses. And of course, brown patch on tall fescue also caused by Rhizotronia solani, but that's going to be as the weather starts warming up in June, and that's one where if folks are inclined to use fungicides, the time will be coming in late May, I believe he told me, for using those fungicides to prevent the brown patch epidemics. So that's a case where the damage occurs during the season in which the plant is most stressed, either or in the cool season, if it's a warm season grass, or vice versa. And you may see a little bit of rust on zoysia, but there are not generally treatments done for with that, I will take any questions. I will see we're right at 12.
right, turn it back over to you then, Lucy. Great. I see a couple people are typing, so there may be some questions coming in for you, um, Mike. Our next plant specimen pathogens is going to, will be on June 24th, um, and we will look forward to seeing you then. We're finishing up right at noon, and um, you guys who have questions can, go, can just finish typing those, and we'll send them on in. Happy spring.